Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie. And today we have with us David Shaw. First time on the show. Thanks a lot for coming on, David. Thank you for having me. Well, I've been a longtime fan and follower of your Twitter account. You, you have a very humorous and uh, very insightful slant, I would say, on the platform, and it's always enjoyable. And I'm really excited to, to chat with you. And one thing that I thought we could cover right here at the top would be your experience working for a company called Square One Financial, because as I understand it, you were more or less thrown into the pit when the global financial crisis was just starting to happen and you somehow climbed your way out. And I, I just love to hear that story and what you learned from that time. Sure. I'm happy to. So it was early 2008 and I had spent a few years working on wall street, um, um, in sell side research. And, um, my wife and I decided to come back to North Carolina. Um, obviously we didn't know the financial crisis was upon us. Um, and I joined a de novo bank called Square One Financial. And the easiest way to think about it is we were very similar to Silicon Valley Bank in that we were a bank that lent to venture-backed companies and the VCs themselves. And so I started in what they called the analyst training program, which was to be a credit, um, credit analyst. So I would underwrite um, new credits. So let's say a company gets a $20 million equity round from a VC, and then we might provide them with a 3 or $4 million line of credit or term loan. And um, so I thought that's what I was going to do. And one day the CEO came to my desk and said, you know, hey, David, I heard you worked on Wall Street. Um, we're having some problems with our investment portfolio, and we'd like some help. And so long story short, and this is the bank's own investments. Um, so basically the deposits that are not lent out, we would invest into the bond market. But the bank had been saddled with a lot of subprime and Alt-A mortgage-backed securities that were bought by their outsourced manager. And so I told the CEO, his name is Richard. Um, I said, Richard, you know, I'm happy to help you out, but I don't know anything about fixed income or credit, let alone mortgage-backed securities. And he said, well, that's, that's okay. You know, we need your help. So um, basically um, the bank had about half a billion of bonds that were going bad and kind of every day they were, you know, falling in value. And, and to think about what was in them, you know, it was very similar to what you saw in the movie, The Big Short. Um, you know, I remember looking at one bond and the bond was only about six months old and it was, already 30% of the borrowers in that pool had not made one single payment on their mortgage. So kind of pulling back, you know, the covers and, you know, looking under the hood of, of these bonds and looking at a loan by loan analysis, it was kind of remarkable and frightening to see just how um, poor a lot of underlying credits were at this time. Um, so, I, so I really had to, you know, self-teach myself. How old were you when this happened? I was, I was only three years out of undergraduate. Yeah. So, so like uh, early twenties. Yeah. Yeah. Early, mid, early to mid twenties. Mid twenties. So it was interesting because nobody really knew what was going on at the time. Um, and everything was unraveling. And I think people didn't know at the time how bad it was going to be. And so I really had to dig in. You know, I started reading prospectuses and modeling cash flows and um, having to meet with the regulators that came in, the, you know, the Fed and FDIC and so forth. And, you know, they surely didn't know what was going on. So it was really quite an interesting environment of having to, to learn in, you know, the biggest financial crisis, you know, the country had seen, you know, since the Great Depression. So it was quite the introduction to credit and fixed income in general. I don't think you meant it this way, but the way you described your boss, Richard, telling you that they were having some problems, you, it, it, he sounded so casual in your delivery there that it, I, I found it humorous. I was envisioning like the boss from office space with a coffee mug, just being like, hey, David, uh, we're having some issues here. <laughs> but yeah, meanwhile, you no, have half it, a billion. <laughs> and I think that there was hope 
you know, that, you know, things would turn around. But, you know, I felt like the more, you know, you peeled back the onion and the more you saw, you know, the more you realized that, you know, these were going to be very problematic. And, and the way that a lot of these mortgage-backed securities are structured is there's different tranches and subordination. So a lot of the bonds were, if you sat in the senior part of the capital structure, you know, they might have been okay, even if, you know, many of the, the underlying loans were bad. If you sat in more mezzanine and junior positions, you know, you could be wiped out, um, you know, let's say if 20 or 30% of the, the loans went bad and started to take losses. So, you know, it wasn't just the underlying credit, but where you sat in the capital structure. And basically going back to that environment is you would get paid, let's say, another 10 or 15 or 20 basis points to assume a lower tranche um, in, the, in the structure of these bonds. And so, you know, they got paid in hindsight what, you know, was a very meager additional interest stream just to take on um, incremental credit risk. But, um, but, you know, the bank ended up raising additional capital. Um, we made it through and, you know, I continued to manage um, the portfolio for Square One, which was kind of, uh, you know, the kitchen sink of credit, whether it was mortgages. Um, investment grade corporate bonds, municipal bonds, preferred stocks, some high yield bonds, and kind of everything in between. So it was kind of an interesting foray into the into the credit market. You mentioned some of the clients not paying their mortgage. My understanding was a big impetus for that crash was not only CDOs, but essentially these variable interest rates that were attached to these mortgages where there was sometimes sort of, I I think even a zero interest rate for a number of years, and then it would pop right to five or 6%. And that's when a lot of families ran into trouble. They maybe expected to have more income by that time and didn't. And then they started falling short. Is that when you were starting to dig into loan by loan, et cetera, of what was going bad, is is that the, the main takeaway that you saw happening? Well, there was certainly some, some of that. There was a lot of different programs. And I think, you know, just for the listeners to highlight kind of what was happening. If you go back to the pre-financial crisis, over half of the mortgages being originated were what you'd call non-agency mortgages. And basically what that means is that those mortgages did not have the backing of the GSEs, meaning Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny Mae. They were not government-backed. And if you go to today, it's kind of all the way at the other end of the spectrum being almost probably 95% government backed in the private, you know, the non-agency market is a pretty small sliver of the overall market. But at that point in time, pre-crisis, you know, there was a lot of creative programs that were put into practice to get that affordability down, to get those teaser rates. Um, And there was a number of different programs that would get um, those. So, So the underwriting, and, you know, the fact that, you know, more than half the originations were outside of the, the GSEs, you know, really, you know, led to a lot of creativity and unfortunately, you know, poor underwriting and, um, you know, that led to a lot of the problems. So you've moved on from working at a bank, but the banking sector is interesting in a lot of ways, somewhat appealing and somewhat not, given obviously the interest rates are still very low, but then you have the fact that you've, you're basically backstopped by the Fed and you've, you're able to sell your bonds with a, a top bidder. Um, and I'm curious, like, what is your general take on the financial sector in today's environment? Well, the financial sector as a whole, um, you know, there's kind of a good and bad to it. So, you know, you mentioned the fact that you know, the Fed has, you know, embarked in kind of unprecedented monetary policy, um, you know, Fed funds being very low, and there's a lot of facilities out there that banks can, you know, borrow from, you know, whether it's the discount window overnight, the Fed, or um, a lot of other programs that they've come out with since. Um, so I think from a funding perspective, from a borrowing perspective, it's a lot easier. Um, but, you know, obviously, the problem right now is that to find earning assets at any type of yield is a lot more challenging. So, I, so I, honestly, I think that 
the banking sector is fairly low risk right now in that capital ratios are pretty high. Um, banks have a lot of sources of liquidity and funding. Um, you know, the, the regulators are a lot stricter on what types of loans can be originated. And I think the asset quality is, is pretty good. And I think a lot of the risk in lending has kind of moved out of the regulated banking sector and kind of more to the non the non-bank, um, you know, shadow banking segment. So with that, I'd like to kind of fast forward now to today or at least 2021, because what you were just saying is, you know, obviously asset prices are at high levels, uh, highest, uh, all-time highs. What was your playbook going into 2021? Because obviously things were high even at the end of 2020. I'm curious, how are you approaching 2021 and, and, if, and, and how has it potentially changed, if at all? Right. Well, um, I'm just pulling up the interest rate chart, but if you went back to the end of last year, um, you know, the 10 year treasury was at 92 basis points. Um, we had not had the Georgia runoffs yet. And I think there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of, you know, uncertainty just as far as who is going to control Congress, you know, and at that point, you know, what type of fiscal spending would come to be. Um, so coming into there, interest rates were pretty low. I think the general consensus on the street was that we'd probably have a, um, you know, a split Congress, you know, that the Republicans would probably keep control of um, the Senate and the Democrats would have the House and maybe President Biden could get through some things, but probably not aggressively. And I think that that playbook kind of changed once the, the Dems swept the runoff in January. And you start to see a lot of the cyclicals rally. Um, interest rates started to pop. Um, so, you know, they went from, um, I think, the end of September last year, 10 year at 65 basis points to they peaked at just about 175 um, at the end of March last year or this year. Rather, so it was you know over a hundred basis point rise, and really um, rotation into cyclicals. Um, so I think I think the speed at which that happened was probably a little bit surprising for a lot of market participants. But we had also been the market had not been accustomed to a scenario where you had not only monetary policy being easy, but also fiscal spending. Um, you know, obviously during the COVID pandemic, you know, there was the emergency spending and PPP and different types of stimulus. Um, but obviously since then, they've also enacted other programs. So the type of fiscal spending to plug the demand gap, you know, that happened as the economy went to a standstill, you know, something we really haven't seen before. So I, I think, you know, the combination of all that and the additional spending um, really, you know, gave a lot of fuel to the market and for a while led to a pretty big rotation and, you know, interest rates going up, cyclicals rallying and, you know, kind of a change in market leadership, which, you know, probably lasted until May and early June when, um, you know, I think the, the Delta variant fears came back and, you know, interest rates have kind of given back some of their, um, you know, gains in yield since then. And we touched on all-time highs. The S&P 500 is up a little over 20% year-to-date. Russell's up 16. NASDAQ's up 21. <laughs> you know, um, just year-to-date. And this is at the time of recording, obviously, which is uh, early September. What is the indicator that has recently made you sit back in your chair and just say, wow, you know, given where you maybe thought we'd be at this point last year, and what has transpired? Is there anything, any metric that stood out to you that's made you kind of, you know, kind of blown your hair back a little bit? Right. No, it's a, it's a fair question. I think, I think the thing that's been most um, amazing this year has been the revision in earnings for the market. So if you think about coming into the year, I think the consensus for the S&P earnings for 2021 was probably around $160 per share. Um, and, 
And typically, economists and sell side is pretty optimistic on that. Um, but in this case, you know, the market has dramatically underestimated just how much the S&P would earn this year. And now fast forward to, as you said, we're in early September, you know, the market is assuming that the S&P can earn north of $200 per share. Um, you, you know, so, so really, you know, there's been a significant push upward in earnings estimates. And I think it's worth looking into why that's happened. Um, so, so, so uh, you, you know, your, your next question is probably going to be, well, why, why have earnings come in so much higher than expectations? And so, so Bingo. Um, <laughs> right, right. And, and, and particularly with all the headlines about rising costs, right? You know, um, input costs are going up, you know, and whether that's transitory or permanent, you know, is yet to be seen. Um, labor costs are going up. So how in the world have S&P earnings gone up this much? And I think the answer is twofold. One, um, you know, top line growth has really exploded. Um, and so, so um, revenue growth has really gone up far higher than, than people thought. And then the second thing is, I think on a, on a cost structure, going into COVID last year, I think a lot of firms really right-sized their business, you know, maybe cut back on different types of expenses that they didn't feel like were, you know, necessary and maybe probably prepared for an environment where, you know, times were probably going to be rough. And I think that, you know, that, that seemed pretty reasonable to think that, you know, you know, in a pandemic that, that companies would have to cut their cost structure. And I think what's happened is revenues exploded and the cost, ba- cost structures have gone up, but not nearly as much as revenues have. And, and therefore, you know, we're really at record um, operating margins. So, so profit margins are now at record highs um, despite all of the stuff happening. And so I, I think most market participants, unless you're looking at these type of things day by day, are not realizing that this has really been an earnings driven driven year. Um, I think most people would probably think, you know, earnings, you know, maybe they're up a little bit, but you know, maybe the multiple on the market has skyrocketed, but it's not really been the case. You know, earnings have really driven, I think, the bulk of um, this year's game. I might postulate one, a third factor, which is related to what you said, I think. But if you're looking at the S&P 500, you know, 25% of it is the FANG stocks, essentially, right? And so those companies get even more operational leverage because they're, they don't have a lot of, I don't want to, I want to phrase this right, but it's not like their cost of goods is that is actually physical. It's usually software based. And w- when everything went online during the pandemics, more or less, I mean, there's this huge gold rush onto Amazon and other platforms because retails were retailers were closed. Do you think that those companies having already high margins that got even higher is playing a big factor into the, the aggregate of the S&P? Oh, there's no, there's no question. I mean, if you look at, um, you know, the free cash flow margins and, you know, you know, all sorts of profitability metrics on mega cap tech, um, you know, it's just head and shoulders above the rest of the market from a profitability perspective. And, you know, going back, decades, kind of the rest of the market is trading at very similar um, profit margins. And it's really been, as you're alluding to, um, S&P being a market cap driven um, index, it's really been a lot, a lot of those mega cap technology companies that have, um, you know, driven a lot of the, the growth and profitability and earnings. You mentioned that there was a lot of liquidity out there that was piling into the market. I'm curious if you follow how much money is still sitting on the sidelines, given that we've already seen such a huge run up. Is there, are you seeing money still on the sidelines that could potentially enter the market? 
Well, that, that phrase is kind of controversial. And um, I guess there's a lot of semantics with the, the whole cash on the sidelines thing. So I'll um, not, not go down that rabbit hole. But I think, um, I think to answer that question a different way, I think a lot of market participants be, really feel like equities are the only game in town, um, especially with um, interest rates so low. Um, and on a real on a real basis, after include after accounting for inflation, um, you know yields are negative. You know treasury yields are negative on a real basis. So I feel like um, you know a lot of participants feel like the equities really are you know one of the only games in town, and that you know sure they've got a lot of embedded gains, um, but really where else are they gonna? realistically, you know, put this, this money if they sell. So I think from that perspective, I think that's, you know, a, a lot of participants and investors might feel like things are expensive, but they're, they're also going to tell you that they don't feel like there's a lot of good places to, to go otherwise. Yeah. As you were saying that I was thinking about your clients, right. Being that you're an advisory, are they, What's the sentiment of your client base? Is it very risk on or is it becoming more risk off as prices have gotten higher? Well, I think to take a step back, I think um, obviously every client's situation is different and and we have to account for that. Um, I think the other thing to think about is we try to set up client portfolios to be resilient during a multitude of um, scenarios. So, for instance, we're not going to try to um, set up an allocation to win under one or two outcomes and, you know, lose heavily under others. So I think I always like to say we try to be approximately right. We'd rather be approximately right than precisely wrong. Um, that being said, I think, I think, you know, your question is clients certainly are surprised that the markets continue to run and, and where we are. and you know, to think back where we've been, um, you know, a year and a half ago, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing to, um, to see. But I think, you know, our goal is to, to try not to predict the near term, but, you know, set up, you know, portfolios to be resilient for a lot of different outcomes. Because, you know, you know the, the smartest minds in the market, and I'm certainly not one of them, um, don't know what's going to happen, right? And so, it's really, you know, I try to think about it being, um, at, you know, more of a scenario analysis. You know, how do we structure portfolios if, if the market ends up running two years longer than people think, you know, versus, you know, you know, what if we really do see, you know, mean reversion and different things and, you know, broad asset prices fall down. So it's really a balance between that and then also handling the psychological profile of each client because, you know, a lot of investing is really not, um, you know, really it's not making bad decisions at the wrong time. You know, you can really, um, you just need to not make, you know, poor decisions a couple times a year. And if you can avoid doing that, then, you know, historically you've been, been good. So there's certainly a psychological component to um, not only when asset prices are high, but also when they're when they're low and falling. I think that's very wise. I am reminded of, you know, something Howard Marks just said on our show, which was that they were essentially moving ahead, but with caution. And that resonates with me because, you know, I would have told you probably back in 2015 that the market was pretty overvalued. I mean, it's just, who's to say it's, it's been running for so long and I hate to beat that drum anymore, but there is something you posted on Twitter recently about valuation suggesting that 25% of tech companies based on the current valuation is suggesting that they might grow at a compound annual growth rate of 15% every year for the next 15 years. You know, so when you see something like that, what do you take from that? I just have to start with you. What, what do you take from that? Well, to a certain degree, the market is enamored with growth. Um, and I think there's some reasons why that's reasonable, um, you know, because I think sometimes growth can cover up a multitude of sins, right? You know, so, you know, take, 
take something like, you know, Google. Um, you know, Google is still growing. I'm just going to pull it up right now. Google is still growing top line, you know, probably over, you know, at or near, you know, high teens, high teens, top line, top line growth. And that's even for, you know, a trillion dollar plus company. Um, and I think people say to themselves, okay, well, if you look out five years, you know, at this horizon point, you know, if we feel confident in the durability of their moat and their competitive position, then we can really stand to believe that at this point in time, they're going to be, you know, this big. And, you know, so that puts, that leaves a lot of room for valuations to compress given a certain growth rate. Um, so, so, so looking out in the future, I think investors have become enamored with, with growth companies. Now, now there's obviously a downside to this because, you know, the, the other side of the coin would say, well, a lot of these companies are being priced to perfection um, and, and they're being priced that they're going to grow, you know, not only 15% per year, but a lot of these higher flying companies to grow substantially more than that into the far, into the far future. Um, so it's, and I think the other thing, you know, people bring up interest rates a lot, but, you know, when a majority, you know, the bulk of your cash flows are in the future, and that's the case in growth companies, right? Because the, 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 their longer duration assets, more earnings and sales are going to become in the future. You know, there's going to be a higher value placed on that when the time value of money has you know, low interest rates like right now. So, so it's certainly an environment like that, but I, I, I really feel like in this environment, a lot of investors are gravitating towards growth, you know, growth covering up a multitude of sins is what I would describe it as. Very interesting. Yeah. I, I hear you say that and, and I'm not sure it was you, but recently on Twitter, I saw someone highlighting the fact that I don't know what it was 10 years ago today or something the Palm Pilot, you know, was valued more than Apple and Google combined, something, something ridiculous like that. And it's such an interesting wake up call, you know, to say, yeah, you can project these, these things out 15 plus years in the future, but then you, re you remember cutting edge tech that, that, you know, as that was back then and how things can change uh, as drastically as they can. No, you, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think if you look across a lot of the high flyers today. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to include mega cap when I, when I say this, just because I think, you know, mega cap is really not valued, you know, nearly as high as some of the, the smaller, you know, small and mid cap um, high flyers. Um, but they, they really do have a high, high hurdle to reach when not only meeting these, you know, th these, these thresholds, but exceeding them. And I think an interest, you know, an important thing for listeners to remember is you take a company like ServiceNow, which is a, you know, prototypical SaaS company, um, you know, they've just had extraordinary growth, but they started from such a large, uh, lower multiple that, you know, they not only got the benefit of, you know, far exceeding sales estimates, revenue estimates, but, you know, they also got the benefit of multiple expansion. Whereas now on some of these, you know, you're starting from a very full, um, you know, price to sales or price to, you know, you know, EBITDA multiple five years out that it's not saying that you can't win, but the bar to, you know, having whatever IRR you're wanting, you're underwriting for is a lot higher than before. So, so I think that's where the margin for error is significantly less than it was, you know, five years ago in these spaces. So the question kind of becomes from that, I guess, what, how are you thinking about allocation and are you, how much are you factoring things like alternative assets or even emerging markets? I'd love to talk about both. Well, I think um, alternatives just, you know, for our particular firm, we do utilize alternative assets. Um, primarily what we use alternatives for is to add um, non-correlated or less correlated um, return streams to traditional assets. Um, so for instance, if we added, you know, 
and I won't name names, but if we added certain, you know, for example, a multi-strategy fund um, that was, you know, historically been non-correlated with stocks and bonds, um, you know, it might produce, you know, more, you know, more steady stream, you know, a better risk adjusted stream going out into the future. So, you know, pretty much, you know, the vast majority of our alternatives are not to shoot for, you know, market beating returns, but really, you know, I talk, I, I kind of refer to it as smoothing the path out. Um, you know, you can try, try to optimize for path um, of assets or portfolios and try to optimize for destination, but you can't really do do both. So, so I'd say a lot of the alternatives that we're um, including into portfolios are really to smooth out the path, um, you know, to limit downside and to provide, you know, a, a better, you know, risk adjusted return for the, the overall portfolio. Now, whether, whether or not these alternatives end up providing that, obviously one, one can debate, but, but really the goal is to, you know, to add some return streams, which are less correlated and, to traditional stocks and bonds. Right. I, I know there's a, a Ray Dalio quote about the holy grail of investing is something like 15 uncorrelated bets, as you're kind of alluding to. And so, and there's also a wide range of alternatives. So I, I'm wondering if you could give us maybe one example of an alternative that you found maybe recently appealing. Um, well, I, I, I won't talk specific funds, but I'll give, you know, a highlight, you know, some examples, um, you know, for instance, in the fixed income arbitrage space, um, this would be an example of a non-directional fund, meaning that, you know, if they're investing in credit and interest rates, in the case of interest rates, they're not betting on whether interest rates are going to go down or up. And in the case of credit, they're not necessarily betting on, um, you know, credit spreads going to contract or widen or vice versa. But, you know, one example of a, of a trade might be, you know, taking, you know, betting on the mortgage basis. So, for instance, you know, you might be betting or investing such that mortgage spreads would, would tighten. Um, so, so you might be long, you know, they call it long the mortgage basis and that, you know, you'd be long agency mortgages and, you know, short the risk-free, you know, treasuries against it. Or um, there might be, you know, treasury ARP where, you know, you might be buying a nine and a half year treasury and selling a 10 year treasury. So, so basically trying to find little inefficiencies and arbitrages in the market in which you can exploit. And theoretically, those would not be tied to, for instance, the direction of the S&P 500 or the direction of the Barclays Ag, um, but would have a different profile towards that. That's fascinating. I'm wondering how much you might be thinking about emerging markets at a time like this. Is there anything outside of the U.S. that's appealing to you at the moment? Uh, you know, from time to time, we'll, we'll look at that. I, I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, idiosyncratic risks. To, to those segments and um, obviously driven a lot by, um, by FX and, you know, how, how those currencies do against the dollar, depending on, um, you know, which type of emerging assets. So, you know, from time to time, you know, potentially for tactical positions, but I wouldn't say that, you know, we're investing substantially in emerging markets, but that doesn't mean, you know, our position is, you know, that's just my personal preference, but, you know, it doesn't mean that can't change, you know, maybe in our eyes, you know, they become very attractive in six months or, you know, vice versa. Given your personal preference or your, your experience, which seems heavily weighted in the credit space, are you, how are you thinking about bonds? I know it's a generalized question, but how do you think about bonds at a time like this with interest rates as low as they are? Is your question referencing um, risk premium treasuries or yeah, more like of, the ten year? Let's just take that. Well, okay. Um, I think a lot of investors and maybe casual observers kind of um, ooh and ah over over that. Um, so, so I think that there's a couple of things 
at play. Um, you know, one is that there's a, a lot of forced buyers of these assets, um, whether it's, you know, sovereign wealth funds or, you know, central banks or um, banks, or there's a lot of forced buyers of these type, this type of paper. Um, you know, the other thing is obviously demographically, you know, there's a lot of studies that point to demographics being, you know, a major driver of, you know, lower, not only nominal, but, um, you know, real yield in developed markets. So um, that's certainly, and that's not a new trend. I mean, that's a, a 30, you know, 30, you know, plus year trend, but obviously the implications for where risk-free assets trade impact um, everything else. Um, you know, there's no question that, you know, how risk-free trade, um, you know, impacts other things. And clearly central banks have become buyers and, um, you know, which has added different dynamics. Um, so it's, you know, it's one of those things, I think, um, you know, it used to be a source of income for cl for clients and institutions and, and really, you know, I think gone are, gone are those days. I think, I think a lot of, um, Retirees used to look forward to the the ability to buy munis at you know four percent um, tax free yields, and that's not a that's not a it's not a factor anymore. Um, I don't think that means that bonds are completely useless. Um, I think if you think about um, treasuries, particularly the long end of the curve, long treasuries traditionally have been one of the few places that have um, provided really risk off exposure. Um, so, so, so when, you know, when things get really bad, um, you know, so it's interesting, you go back to March, 2020. So what, when things are kind of bad, you know, for instance, investment grade credit, investment grade munis might get a bid, but then if they get really, really bad, well, then when, then investors want to dump those too. So, so it's, it's kind of this funny thing where, um, if, if the markets get bad enough, you know, things that are perceived as safe, munis, investment grade corporates, you know, those asset classes, which are originally a flight to safety end up becoming dumped. So that leaves, you know, at the depths of um, last March, um, you know, treasuries, you know, with positive convexity, you know, are one of the few things that can really provide diversification and, um, performance when times are really bad. So, so I think from that perspective, um, you, you know, you can't completely throw away the space um, as an asset class because, you know, there's certainly, you know, benefits to those in adverse market environments. Now, I'm kind of curious about the negative yielding debt in the world. It's turned around a little bit. Uh, there was about 18 trillion back in December trading negative and yielding negative, I should say, whereas now it's something like 12 trillion, but we're still talking about $12 trillion negatively, negative in negative yield. So not to say you're invested in that. I'm just kind of curious what your take on that is. What do you, what would be the desire to go into something like that? Well, again, I think, you know, an individual might be able to, you know, keep cash on, you know, metaphorically speaking, keep cash under their mattress, but, you know, larger institutions, um, you know, have to have, um, might be required to have certain, you know, positions in, in certain quantities. So, you know, whether that's commercial banks or others, you know, they're kind of forced into, into holding that. And, um, um, you know, I think the Fed is, Clearly, you know, we're not in a position where I think we've had a entertain really, you know, going, they call it neg nom, you know, negative nominal rates, you know, could that, you know, happen in the future? I don't think it will, but, you know, clearly we've seen it in the developed world and, you know, other, you know, G6 countries. And um, it's certainly a fascinating, fascinating thing to look at. Well, we're certainly in negative real rate territory at the moment. And a lot of that is due to some of the risks we've highlighted with the supply chain issues and the inflation involved. 
my question, I guess, is what is the biggest risk for the market right now, in your opinion? The biggest risk, probably something that we're not thinking about or looking at right now. I mean, you know, traditionally, typically, um, you know, there's, there's things that come up every year, oftentimes multiple times a year. So, you know, are we going to get another drawdown? Sure. You know, is it going to be now or is it going to be 10% higher from here? You know, nobody, nobody knows. But um, I think a lot of the kind of obvious ones, you know, would be, you know, would corporate tax rates go up? Um, you know, that's certainly, you know, something that could happen and be- become a, a headwind. Um, you know, could there be, you know, some other strain of, of um, COVID, you know, I think that, you know, I think the market's kind of brushed that off to a large degree with, with the Delta variant, but, you know, obviously, you know, things could, things could happen. Um, but typically it's, you know, it's probably an unknown factor that, that's driving things. And, you know, markets are never about absolute numbers, but, you know, it's all about, you know, from a relative perspective, you know, you know, what's going to happen relative to what the market expecting. So, um, you know, we might still have a recovery and things might still be going good from a earnings perspective or whatever, but, but maybe relative to what everybody's thinking, you know, it comes in short due to X, Y, or Z. So that, that, that you know, it might be a kind of a cop-out answer, but most likely it's going to be something that we're not thinking about at the moment. No, I like it. You did mention demographics earlier and, and what came to my mind was something I read recently about, you know, possibly running out of social security money in 12 years and things like that, which to me just implies more printing, you know, for more devaluing of our, our dollar and, and, and possibly um, risking our, our, our position in the world, uh, at least our credit worthiness. Is that of any concern in your eyes or is that something you guys factor into your investing at all? I think absolutely. Do we make capital market assumptions? Yes. Um, you know, I think, you know, with the United States being a currency issuer, you know, our big, our big constraint on borrowing is really, you know, inflation. Um, and, and that gets a whole another rabbit hole of what inflation is and what, what metrics. we won't go down that one today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Th- thank you. Please get somebody get a guess that's far brighter on that topic than I am. But um, um, yeah, I think f- f- from that perspective, certainly, you, you know, certain market proponents believe that we have a lot of um, capacity to borrow more to, to spur demand. You know, I think others, you know, believe that, you know, we can't just, um, you know, run up, um, you know, the deficits that we are without, there being some kind of, you know, you know, longer term implications and, you know, that there could be, you know, unknown consequences of, you know, the types of stimulus programs that we're, we're doing. But I think the answer is, you know, I try to, you know, we're certainly going to be looking at all, you know, the inflation and demographic situations and um, fiscal environments. And, you know, I think all those things are very important when, making investment decisions, but I think it's also important not to let my personal opinions on what's happening with the Fed or the Congress or whatever, um, you know, skew my thinking in terms of how, how, because, you know, think about it, we can't control, I was just talking about, talking about this with somebody on Twitter, you know, no matter what we think, whether we think policy is the best or the worst or in between, we can't control that to a large degree. We can vote, if we should, um, but we can't control things after that. So, you know, from an investor's perspective, an allocator or active managers, you know, it's our responsibility to invest in the environment that we have. Um, so back to your original question, certainly, you know, those are things that we think about, but um, whether or not they're going to impact today or the near term or the medium term is, is more the, more the issue. I like that. And it obviously 
harks, harkens back to, you know, investing from the ground up. So I'm curious if you had, let's call it three businesses that you could invest in over the next, say, five to 10 years, which companies, in your opinion, are best suited to kind of endure whatever might be coming over that time frame and, and outperform? Okay, well, I, the first, okay, I'll give, a, I'll give a couple of ideas. The first caveat being that we do own positions in these, these securities, um, our, our firm um, and myself personally. But I think, you know, one company that I like a lot, and, and I'll talk, I'll talk business-wise, you know, which businesses do I think, you know, are going to do well, um, you know, whether or not, so I'll hedge a little bit, you know, whether or not the stock is actually do well, you know, kind of early to tell, but, you know, one of them is a payments company called Adian. So Adian's a Netherlands-based payment company. And so basically what they do is they offer a single payments platform to accept payments anywhere on any device, whether that's, you know, e-commerce or in person. And kind of the interesting thing about Adian, and most people haven't heard of them, maybe more so in the last year or so, um, but really they were built from the ground up in 2006. And the reason that the founders did this is because the way that things were set up before, um, it was kind of a hodgepodge of different systems that were built on old infrastructure. And so, you know, a lot of these old payments companies, you know, kept acquiring, bolted on, cut costs, and really the underlying technology wasn't really that good. And so I think Adyen, you know, the, the one the one platform anywhere, you know, whether it's, you know, whether in the, you're in the US or Brazil, whether you're online or in person, you know, this has really been a great business. And, you know, a lot of their growth has been in large enterprises. So if you think eBay, Spotify, Uber, Etsy, um, you know, last quarter, I think they won Louis Vuitton. Um, you know, and this is a business that I think can really grow revenue by probably 30% per year, you know, for the next decade, really. And not only that, but their EBITDA margins are in the mid 60s. So they're, they're insanely profitable. Um, you know, optically, the company's expensive, but I think, you know, these, these trends of, um, you know, kind of unified, you know, in omni commerce, meaning, you know, maybe you order online and then you can return it to the store, or maybe you go into a shoe store and they don't have it in store, but then you can buy it in store and ship it home. You know, more, you know, this, you know, omni commerce is becoming more and more part of the way that the world is working, especially post COVID and a e commerce boom. And I think Adyen is really positioned at a lot of, you know, super, super important secular growth trends. And, you know, I, I think the bet, because obviously, you know, you're paying a little bit of a higher, you know, higher multiple for this growth. Um, but I think, you know, the bet is that with a lot of great companies over time, I think investors can focus too much on the stated valuation and not as much on the optionality that those companies have. So great fast growing companies, you know, historically have had other sources of revenue and profits that emerge. So for instance, if you went back, you know, I'm not comparing Addy to Amazon, but you know, the way that a lot of people look at popular growth companies that really are have durable growth um, profiles is they kind of underprice that optionality. And so, you know, I think my belief is that a company that's growing like this and has such great loyalty and basically, you know, less than 1% churn, um, you know, so much revenue growth coming from existing clients is that they are going to find new sources of revenue. So I believe in the, you know, you know, top line growth of their core business, but I think that there's other things that are going to come about, whether that's issuance of cards um, or, or whatever that, you know, they're going to drive this company into the future. So I think that's certainly one that I like a lot, you know, for, for the future. And obviously, 
caveat being that you know that we have owned this company for some time. What I'm just curious on that one. What what what's your takeaway on the competitive moat exactly? You know what's going to stop another payment company to kind of infiltrate their their space, given that they're kind of somewhat regional today. Well, regional base there, but, you know, as far as their growth, you know, they've been growing all over the world, but I think, you know, their technology, um, you know, because of their technology, they have, you know, less, less fraud, less, you know, you know, losses and things like that. And I think that their ability to adapt to the environment um, compared to a lot of these legacy players. And I think that's one of the big things the like legacy players are so, stale and unable to innovate that, you know, not only with the e-commerce growth going forward, but the existing share that I think they can take from these, these legacy guys, um, that I think is, is really underappreciated. Right. You mentioned, I, I interrupted you, but I think you were going on to another one. Oh, another company. Well, I, I think the second one I'll say and and it'll be more boring, but I don't think it's any less, you know, important as, as Google. Um, you know, I think, you know, I could highlight Google or Amazon because I, I like them. I like them both. But I mean, if you think about Google, um, obviously you have your, your core business with their ad, ad revenue, which is still, which is still growing. Um, but I think, you know, one of the booming things has become YouTube. Right. And, and just, the, you know, YouTube, you know, think about an amazing story, right? You know, YouTube being purchased for, I think it was a billion dollars. And don't quote me, I'm, I'm, I'm close. I'm probably within 500 million. But I mean, it was a heavily scrutinized acquisition at the time. And the interesting thing is, people didn't even know how they were going to make money. So a lot of people thought it was going to be on the TV aspect. And um, and if you think about how, how, I mean, think about how amazing of a business YouTube is, you have people creating YouTube's own content, right? You know, so they're the content creators of this and, and the flywheel effect of, you know, um, you know, more content drawing, you know, more viewers and more ads. And, you know, so, so that business, I think is just, such an amazing company. And I think up until probably the last year or so, it's really been underappreciated um, because it's been kind of hiding under the, the Google umbrella. Um, but that's become, that's become big. And then I think, you know, after that, to a similar degree, you know, Google Cloud is growing pretty substantially. And it's, it's certainly no question it's a distant third to AWS and Azure. Um, but there's limited, you know, players that can, you know, be a cloud provider in, in the world right now. I think you have to have substantial capital to do that. And I think that they are going to, you know, even if they're not a big, even if they don't displace AWS or Azure, you know, I think it can be still be a great business, you know, over time, even as the number three player in, in the U.S. Um, but not only that you know, just the amount of, you know, free cash flow that they're, you know, generating, you know, last, last 12 months as of 630, you know, it looks like close to 60 billion of free cash flow. And so, you know, not only does that give them flexibility for, um, you know, acquisitions, which I think, you know, they've been pretty conservative on, um, but also buybacks, right? Um, you know, they've started to really pull the buyback lever. And I think that they've been a lot more conservative on that than, you know, at least, you know, next to somebody like Apple, you know, which is utilized that a lot more. And I think that that's going to become a bigger, bigger and bigger thing, but it's, it's hard to believe that um, a company like Google is still, you know, if they do over, you know, 210 billion of revenue for 2021, that they're still growing in the mid teens, mid to high teens. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, Remarkable. So I think that, you know, it's a reasonable valuation going forward. And you've got, a, you know, quite a few engines underneath their core business that are going to grow. And I think, um, you know, as you look out a couple of years, 
not that many years. If you look out a couple of years with Google's growth, I mean, they've certainly re-rated in the last year, but it's very reasonable um, compared to a lot of companies in S&P that are trading in the low 20s, you know, PE right now with, you know, revenue growth that's inflation or just a little bit higher than inflation. I think you can take Google for, um, you know, a similar multiple, a little bit higher multiple, but on a forward basis, you know, significantly cheaper. So um, I think that there there is some safety in the growth as far as um, mega, mega cap tech goes. The, yeah, <laughs> the phrase in my mind was the rich get richer for whatever reason that was. Uh, what yeah, kind of came and, to mind. But, and, and so, you know, what happens with the regulatory environment? You know, I, I don't know, you know, will something happen to some of these? Probably. Um, will it be punitive to the stock? My guess, probably not. Um, in that it's probably going to take a long time. And, you know, at that point in time, you know, these companies might be a lot larger than they are now. And, you know, you know, potentially the pieces might be sold for more, more than, you know, the sum of the parts. So you know, that's another thing to think about, but, you know, certainly, you know, at least the headline um, that could be a headwind. David, this was so much fun. Um, thank you for sharing a few of those uh, ideas. I think they're super interesting. And uh, this was a very holistic discussion on markets, on companies, on a whole number of things. And so I know our audience is going to glean a lot of insight from it. I really hope we can do this again sometime soon. And uh, I'm going to continue to follow you on Twitter and enjoy your commentary. And, uh, and I hope we get to do it another time. Likewise, Trey. Thank you for having me on and I look forward to it. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.